Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we have the honor and the privilege to hear the words from our guest of honor, Mr. Tim Reed. Emmy-nominated actor, director, and producer, Tim Reed has been a mainstay in the entertainment industry for the last three decades. He starred as Venus Flytrap on the popular CBS television series, WKRP in Cincinnati. How many of you remember that? Yeah. All right. From 1978 to 1982, twice he's been nominated for the NAACP Image Award for Best Actor in a Comedy for his popular characters. Mr. Reed has had many starring roles over the years in several television series, including The Richard Pryor Show, Simon and Simon, Frank's Place, Snoops, Save Our Streets, and the hit WB series, Sister, Sister. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for Mr. Tim Reed. Thank you, Venus Flytrap. <laughs> How would you feel if you were named after a plant that eats bugs? <laughs> okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. All right, do this. You guys are in my picture now. Paparazzi time. All right, gotcha. I uh, am very pleased to be here. Debbie K KRP in Cincinnati. You got, some of you remember that? Oh my goodness. Well, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I'll answer the question that you usually get, what was Lonnie Anderson like? <laughs> well, she was an incredible friend of mine, wonderful actress, and yes, they were real. <laughs> get that right out of the way so we can get on. <laughs> I've been very fortunate to um, I have performed in a, quite a few wonderful series. Simon and Simon was mentioned. I played Downtown Brown. Another interesting name. I've never played a, just a regular guy, George Jones, you know. It's always Downtown Brown of Venus. But that was a wonderful series uh, with two wonderful guys, Jameson Parker and Gerald McRae. McRain. Um, Gerald was, was an interesting fellow. He was a true redneck, good friend of mine. He loved to shoot deer out of a truck. He was just a... <laughs> and and uh, Jameson was a refined fellow. English gentleman, drank wonderful scotch. And we had a lot of fun together. We used to travel. We shot a show once in Paris. I don't know if you've been to Paris, but um, I'm not a fan of Parisians. Uh, I like the French, but Parisians are, are, I don't know, they're just rude. Yeah, have you been there? Just rude. I'm telling you, it must be all that cheese they eat. <laughs> I think they need a real good laxative in Paris. <laughs> Clean things out. We were there shooting, and uh, we were shooting a show. And uh, one day we had to do a scene where Jameson was going to, it was a flashback during the time of the Nazi occupation of France, and in particular Paris. And the scene was to be that Jameson was playing the part of his father, who would, at that time fictitiously had served. And uh, we had this scene, so we needed some extras. And so we, get, we sent in a call to the local central casting, send us four Nazis. And uh, so they got the call, and we got there early that morning. We start very early in our business. It was about six, waiting for the sun to come up and dawn to break, and we were all dressed and ready to go, and uh, waiting for this scene to be shot. And I wanted to see it because we were at this beautiful French uh, chateau. At uh, seven o'clock, no Nazis. Eight o'clock, no Nazis. Now, American filmmakers are very, you know, they're, let's get it going, let's get it going, we're spending money, we're spending money. So they're making calls back to uh, Central City and they kept going, yes, they're coming, they're coming. You Americans, you all just relax, relax. So about noon, <laughs> a little van was coming down the road. You could see the dust. They were hurrying up to get there. And the van pulled up, and out of the van, dressed as Nazis, four actors appeared. Two of them were black. <laughs> now, I'm the only black guy on the crew and on the set in Paris. Everybody looked at me. <laughs> you speak their language. <laughs> so they called back to central casting. Hello, we got a problem. They said, what's the problem? You sent us 
Four Nazis, yes, that's what you asked for. Well, two of them are black. It's so, all you Americans, you're so hung up on race. <laughs> True story. We shot it with two Nazis, of course. <laughs> I am humbled by this opportunity to join you this afternoon. On this, the last day of our annual celebration of the history of Americans of African descent. And what I must say is, well, one of the most colorful and variety-packed celebrations I think I've ever seen. Leave it to the military. You, you put on one heck of a show, starting with Sergeant Allen setting the tone with her voice and the, and the band, incredible band, sax player. Your brother can blow. We got to check his records. <laughs> And on and on with the dancers from VSU, Ms. Wadsworth, a wonderful packed performance. You know, as, uh, as the young man in that natty hat said, thanks to Carter G. Woodson, we have been celebrating black history since 1926. It started out only as a week to celebrate the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. In 1976, 50 years later, it became a monthly celebration Bunch of folks, important folks, got together and said, hey, give them a month. <laughs> What's the shortest month on the calendar? <laughs> oh, yeah, February. <laughs> give them February. <laughs> and we'll throw in an extra day every leap year. <laughs> yeah, give them that one. And let them come together and celebrate themselves, themselves. <laughs> so I thank Carter G. Goodson, Woodson, who was an incredible man of great character, a Virginian, a scholar, an author, a philosopher. He was the second black man to earn a PhD in America. OK, black history pop quiz. Who was the first African American to win a PhD and a, from an American university. I know you don't know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was Edward Alexander Boche. Mr. Boche was the first African American to earn a PhD from an American university. He earned his PhD in physics from Yale University in 1876 having written a dissertation on measuring refractive indices. Now, I have no idea what that means, so Google it. <laughs> <laughs> but think about this. Eleven years before Mr. Boucher earned his PhD in physics, it was against the law to teach a black man to read or write in America. What are you doing with that book, boy? I, was, uh, I think they're calling the book, sir. I'm just holding it. <laughs> what you doing with it? Just looking at the pretty pictures, master. What is that a picture of, boy? They call it an atom, sir. Well, put that book down and go in the field and make yourself useful. Yes, sir. I'm going to make myself useful, all right. all right. Eleven years later, Mr. Boucher was the sixth American of any race to earn a Ph.D. in physics. His father, William Boucher, was a former slave who had been freed thanks to the passage of the 13th Amendment, again, just 11 years earlier. It took great character for both of them to achieve this milepost. Speaking of incredible people of our history, recently I had the pleasure of speaking at an uh, event honoring the legacy of Dr. King. And, uh, you know, I've always felt in order to speak on Dr. King, one should have a touch of the preacher in him. Well, I can tell you with my checkered pass, that eliminates any opportunity <laughs> for a touch of the preacher. As a matter of fact, I'm not even allowed to play a preacher on television. <laughs> However, my grandma would have been proud to have seen me standing there speaking on, a, on behalf of a great preacher. She always wanted me to be a preacher. She used to say, Junior, I don't know why, but you're going to be something. 
you might as well be a preacher. <laughs> Despite having no more than a sixth grade education, my grandma was one of the wisest people I have ever met in my life. She had that simple dead-on, down-home wisdom. She could tell if you were lying before the words dried on your lips. <laughs> to give you some idea of her wisdom, in 1973, the year she passed, a few months early, I was that time uh, living in Chicago, and I got a call, and it said, your grandmother's in the hospital. She wants to see you. I didn't even stop. I jumped in my car. I drove 16 hours from Chicago to Norfolk, Virginia to get to the hospital to see my grandma. So as I go into the hospital, I walk up on the floor, and I'm going down the hallway in a hurry. And some nurse came out. And she said, you must be Junior. She waiting for you. So I go in, and my grandmother was sitting on the side of the bed, all dressed. I said, baby, I'm ready to go. I knew you were coming. <laughs> get me out of here. They're trying to kill me. <laughs> I said, OK, Grandma. Her wig was on crooked. So I took her out put in my car and I'm taking her home. She said, baby, she said, you know what you got to do? I said, yes, ma'am. So I stopped at the local drugstore and got her a can of society snuff. <laughs> and she had a snuff. She was happy. She said, now take me to the post office, baby. I got to get some stamps. I said, yes, ma'am. So I took her to the post office. She wanted to get in. She'd been hemmed up for two days. So I brought her in the post office. I said, you stand over here, Grandma, while I queue up and get the stamps. And so I was there for the you know, post office, long lines. So I kept looking back at my grandma, and she was just standing at the board looking at pictures. And she's just intense. I go, what in the world is she looking at? So I got out of line. I said, Grandma, are you all right? She said, yeah, baby. She said, who are these people? I looked. I said, oh, uh, those are people wanted by the police and the FBI. She said, they want them? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, why didn't they keep them when they took the picture? <laughs> kind of wisdom I grew up with. <laughs> what a wise woman. You know, people back then seemed to have known things we have forgotten today. First of all, they knew that life was made for living. Today we seem to spend a lot of time hoping and praying that things will get better. Hoping we'll hit the lottery. Remember when we used to own the lottery? It was called running the numbers. <laughs> but they told you, you can't do that. That's illegal. And they took it, called it the lottery. <laughs> but people today just are hoping, hoping things get better. But few of them take action to make things better. We seem to want to leave the art of making things happen to other people, politicians, and celebrities. My grandma was the reason I first met Dr. King. Our paths crossed at a few important times in my life. First was at my church in Norfolk, Virginia, where I grew up. The year was 1960, and Dr. King came to our church to speak. At that time, I was a problem teenager. Well, let's just testify this morning. <laughs> I was a hoodlum <laughs> in training. I was one of those black at-risk kids. You hear about all the back in the day we were colored at-risk kids. <laughs> Broken home, poverty. We were so poor, we couldn't afford but two letters. We were just P.O. Po. <laughs> I was an underachiever and hell-bent on staying that way. My grandma used to say, Junior, whatever you're going to be, be the best at it. And I was determined to be the best damn fool Church Street had ever produced. <laughs> I was good at it teenage delinquent, the old school model, which today we call gangbangers. 40 ounce toting, stocking cap wearing fool. Although back in the day our drink of choice was cheap wine. What's the word? Number. What's the price? <laughs> I see I want the only one. About that time in my life, I discovered who my real 
father was. He came in my life and uh, out of nowhere. And he gave me a choice. He said, either come live with me and go to school regularly, or I'll kill you. <laughs> Let's see, death of school. I'll take school for 20, Alex. <laughs> Back then, parents had a simple solution for unruly children. I brought you into this world, I'll take you out. And we believed them. Today, you punish a kid, they take you to court. As much as my grandmother whipped my butt, she'd be in prison for life. <laughs> About that time, before my father came in my life, they were trying to decide whether to send me to reform school, kitty prison. <clears throat> my grandmother called the pastor of the church, and, he asked, and she asked him to speak with me. And he must have seen something in me that I didn't know was there. He said, okay, next Sunday, Dr. King is coming in here, and you think you're hoodlum, and you should be a good bodyguard. I want you to bodyguard Dr. King. <laughs> so me and a, another young fellow were assigned to be his bodyguards for that day. When the day came, I had the pleasure of being with Dr. King for a few hours. It was like being with a rock star. First of all, I had never met anyone like that in my life. You could clearly see he was a man of great character. I'd never seen anyone like that. He, he had gravitas. After that eventful day, I decided that if education could turn out someone like that, that maybe school wasn't a bad idea. And also, this civil rights thing that I've been hearing a lot about might be something that I should get involved in. My next chance meeting with Dr. King came on August 28, 1963. A friend of mine, three of us, had crammed ourselves in Austin Healy and driven up from Norfolk to D.C. to be there early, pre-dawn. We get there and we're so tired we fall asleep at the base of the Washington Monument. We were awakened by the sound of music coming from Peter, Paul, and Mary. And they were singing, If I Had a Hammer. I thought to myself, thank God I don't have a hammer because they woke me up and scared me to death. <laughs> I'd never seen so many people gathered around me, tens of thousands of people. That was a day that I will never forget. It challenged and changed my life. For a while, I managed to march a few rows back from Dr. King, and A. Philip Randolph, and Roy Wilkins. I was able to find a perch, a small tree, about the time that Dr. King gave his famous speech. Before coming up to the march, I was a Black Panther advocate. I thought violence was the only way to make this nation grant us our freedom. Dr. King changed my mind that day. He washed my heart of hatred. I went back to college and quit SNCC and became president of the student chapter of the NAACP. His words still rang in my head. And on that great day, a quarter of a million people joined in his dream for the future. His words were so powerful. And just about every speech he gave, he spoke of his dreams for the future. He dreamt of a day in our nation when our children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And today, what is the character of our children? Is it the media-driven, bling-bling, obsessed, shop till you drop, hip-hop, gangster, booty shaking, it's all about the money, housewives of Atlanta, now generation? I don't think that's what he had in mind. Dr. King was not just a civil rights leader. Time has proven that he was a prophet. This is what he had to say 50 years ago about our future. There is nothing more dangerous than to build a society with a large segment of people in that society who feel that they have no stake in it, who feel they have nothing to lose. People who have a stake in their future and their society protect their society. But when they don't have it, 
they unconsciously want to destroy it. Look at our urban cities. Do you see a pride of community, a consistent declaration of love, of culture, our heritage? Many of us have pushed aside the history of their cultures. We appear to have stepped in an age of forgetfulness. We seem to have forgotten that those of us, black Americans, are survivors of one of the greatest holocausts to have rained down on humankind. We didn't just survive against all odds. We have prospered. It started on the shores just a few miles from here, in Jamestown. In 1619, 20 Africans from what is now Angola were unloaded from a ship upon this land. From 20 to over 40 million, we rose. From slave ships to spaceships, from the slave house to the White House, I am of a people who have fought in every war this country has engaged in. From Crispus Attucks, the first to die in the Re American Revolution, to Colin Powell, and now to you. We have fought in foreign lands for the freedoms of others when we didn't have those same freedoms right here at home. Now that's irony. That's character. You know, I've, I've spent the last few years not too far from here at my studio, and we've been doing a lot of documentaries. We've done documentaries on blacks in the military. One of my favorite happens to star the gentleman we have with us, Colonel Porsche Taylor, 555. Um, we've done documentaries on the builders of the Alaskan Highway. We've done documentaries on the Red Wall Express. We'll have some of the documentaries for sale when we leave here. What could possibly happen in the world today that could be worse than what has already been survived? And now in these difficult times, where are the people of character? Most of us are running around full of doubt, scared to death, crying the blues. We're broke. We don't have any money. You ever notice that black folks go broke while others just go bankrupt? <laughs> <laughs> we just go broke. It's all gone. We got nothing. On the other side of town, they rupture a bank and declare themselves too big to fail. Meanwhile, black folks are now banking at the local pawn shop. There is far too much negative energy in our world today. Folks are all the Twitter, Twittering back and forth. It's the end of the world. I'm scared. You scared? Twittering your every thought and fears. Well, I don't Twitter, and I don't take on the role of victim in all this foolishness. I come from a long line of survivors. I've got young men and women like yourselves covering my flank. There's no reason to be afraid. Plus, the fact of the matter is there's more money in the hands of folks today than since the time of King Solomon. And yet we feel poorer than our fathers and our grandfathers. Our grandparents' parents didn't have any money, and yet they made it through the Great Depression. Folks took table scraps and made a meal. Today we call it soul food. <laughs> Back in the day, they did, they did more for our communities with a lot less. They built colleges, hospitals. Black folks owned national newspapers. They told their own story. It was the Chicago Daily Defender that brought the issue of lynching in America to the attention of a government not the New York Times. There were black banks in just about every large black community in America. There were black-owned movie theaters. There were seven movie theaters owned or operated by blacks in my neighborhood in walking distance of my house. Black producers made race movies that reveal the wide spectrum of who we were as a people, from singing cowboys to oil barons. As a kid, I had never met a black millionaire. Now, I had heard of people in my neighborhood who were thousandaires, <laughs> but of course they worked for the post office. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, they were not the good old days. Times were hard. There was very little justice. This was the height 
of racial segregation. And yet against it all, our fathers, our mothers, our grandparents stood tall and dared to meet their challenge. How did they do it? What did they have in abundance that is in short supply today? They had what Dr. King mentioned in his speech. They had a strong content of character. Look around today. Last week, I was in London. And over there in England, people are shocked. And they're shocked caused by the horse meat scandal. While watching the news, I asked myself one evening, what kind of human being would knowingly feed his customers inferior meat to make more profit? The answer is simple, a man who is void of character. So this all brings me to my topic for today. You all saying he's just getting to his topic? <laughs> At ease. <laughs> Hope you all brought your jammies. I feel like preaching this morning. <laughs> I should take up a little collection. Well, some of the urshers just go around. No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> During this month, folks all over this troubled nation have celebrated the legacy of people like Dr. King, Colonel. And after all the well-spoken words, the praise and songs, many of us will go back to business as usual, doing everything we can to avoid the real struggle. Meanwhile, our children will continue to seek guidance from something or someone other than the people of character in their community. Because of a few elders who passed through my life and cared enough to straighten me out when I was really going the wrong way, a bastard child born in poverty became the only member of his immediate family to graduate both from high school and college. I went on to become